If you'll join me in your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, and this morning we will be looking at verses 7 through 10. The ancient Roman philosopher Seneca called himself a homo non tolerabilis, which is translated to mean a man not to be tolerated. As some of you think that about me when we hang out. But humankind, Seneca reasoned, needs a hand to lift them up. Similarly, Chuck Colson tells a story of watching Albert Speer in a Good Morning America interview many years ago. Speer was Adolf Hitler's confidant whose technological genius kept the Nazi factories running throughout World War II. And of the 24 war criminals that were tried at Nuremberg, Speer was the only one who admitted that he was guilty. He was sentenced to serve 20 years in prison. Speer had written a book and was being interviewed about it, and the interview asked Speer about one of his writings from earlier in his life, and he said, you have said the guilt can never be forgiven or shouldn't be. Do you still feel that way? Chuck Colson said he will never forget the look on Speer's face as he answered the question. Speer said, I served a sentence of 20 years. And I could say, I'm a free man. My conscience has been cleared by serving the whole time of my punishment, but I can't get rid of it. This new book is part of my atoning of clearing my conscience. And then the interview pressed in harder on this point and asked, you really don't think you'll ever be able to clear it totally? And Spear shook his head vigorously and said, I don't think it will ever be possible. Now compare these two men, Seneca and Speer, with a guy named David Berkowitz. You may know David Berkowitz by the name the Son of Sam or the 44 caliber killer. From July 1976 to 1977, Berkowitz killed six victims and wounded several others all the while, while eluding a massive police manhunt and leaving behind very brazen letters that mocked the police and promised further crimes. All of this was very publicized in the press and much of New York's population was fearful while Berkowitz achieved international recognition. Now when Berkowitz was apprehended and tried, he admitted to all of his crimes. He was given six life sentences for murder in the second degree and attempted murder in the second degree. He was one of the most well-known serial killers in all of Western history. But Berkowitz tells this story in an interview. He said, I was 10 years into my prison sentence and I was constantly in trouble, a disciplinary problem. I had a really bad attitude, living with a lot of anger and so forth. And one night I was walking in the prison yard and another inmate came up to me and introduced himself and said, listen, I know you're David Berkowitz and I want to tell you something. I want you to know that Jesus Christ loves you and has a plan and purpose for your life. And I said, listen, I don't want to hear that because you know I've done too many evil things and there's no forgiveness for me. Maybe there's a God out there someplace, but I don't think he has any interest in me at all. He said, no, you're wrong, David. He can forgive you. And he says, I would like to be your friend. Well, we started to talk a little here and there. I would see him in the yard because he lived on a different cell block and we would meet in the yard and we would walk around together and he started to share Christ with me and within a couple of months time, he led me to the Lord. The interview responded, Now, there are those who will be skeptics saying this is just a jailhouse confession and Berkowitz responded, I know what Jesus Christ has done in my life and I can understand that people in prison, out of prison can be skeptical, but I have put my faith in Jesus Christ. He has done so much for me. I believe in him and no matter what people say, I'm going to continue to serve him. 
I serve the Lord, ministering to the men in here, doing Bible studies with the guys. I go into the chapel, I'm a chaplain's clerk now, and I preach the gospel even overseas through correspondence and testimony tracks and so forth. So I know I'm living for Jesus. And no matter what man may say, I belong to him. I've been purchased by Jesus Christ with his blood. Now, Chuck Colson, again, wrote about watching the interview with Albert Speer, the former Nazi. And he said, for 35 years, Speer had accepted complete responsibility for his crime. His writings were filled with contrition and warnings to others to avoid his moral sin. He desperately sought expiation, all to no avail. I wanted to write Speer to tell him about Jesus and his death on the cross, about God's forgiveness, But there wasn't time. The ABC interview was his last public statement and he died shortly after. Now you see the tragedy for both Seneca who said he's a man to not be tolerated and Spear who thought there was no forgiveness for him is that there was and there is a hand to lift them up. Complete forgiveness of sins though they didn't know it. But then we look at a guy like David Berkowitz, who the world would say is the lowest of low when it comes to humanity. And yet he says with confidence, no matter what I have done, and no matter how people think of me, I know who Jesus is. I know what Jesus has done. And while I deserve every bit of punishment I get, I am his and I am forgiven. And as we look at Paul's letter to the Ephesians, we come this morning to the great promises of redemption and forgiveness in the Lord Jesus Christ. Seneca was right. Humankind needs a hand to lift them up. Spear was wrong. Forgiveness for every sin is available. Berkowitz is evidence even the worst crimes against mankind can be washed in the blood of Jesus. But the question is why and how? That's where Paul goes in our text as we look at Ephesians chapter one. Now, in the original Greek, the apostle writes verses three through 14 in Ephesians chapter one as a single lengthy sentence without any breaks at all. So we're going to read beginning in verse three, but our focus will be on verses seven through 10. So Ephesians chapter one, let's begin reading in verse three. Blessed be the God and Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption, through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Well, this is one long, beautiful, truth-filled sentence from the Apostle Paul. Every word of this is worthy of our attention. So all of us should take time to immerse ourselves in Ephesians chapter one. But let's look carefully at verses seven through 10. And the first implication of what the Apostle Paul identifies here is what we see in verse seven, that Christians are redeemed and forgiven because of the riches 
of God's grace. Now again, in verses three through six, Paul's main focus there in verses three through six is on the work of the Father. And he narrows in specifically on the blessings of election past. He asks what, he's asking rhetorically, what did God do before the foundations of the earth? That was the question he sought to answer. And, and so then he answers that question in those verses, but then here in verse seven, the focus shifts to the work of the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word of God, the only begotten Son of God. And he focuses primarily on our present redemption and its future effects. And all along the way, Paul's words are rather celebratory, aren't they? He's saying all of these great things that God has done, that we have benefited from. And all of this, he says multiple times, is to the praise of his glorious grace. And in these four verses leading up to our text, Paul has praised God for election. He has praised God for our standing before God as, uh, as being holy and blameless. He has praised God for our adoption as sons and daughters of God, having been taken out of the family of Satan and made to be the children of God. Paul frequently points us to all of these great blessings this being in Christ and, and our being uh, a people living through Christ, which is all based on our union with Christ as our representative. And none of this is obtained apart from Christ himself. And so Paul writes in verse seven, in him who is the beloved, who we see being referenced in verse six, that's Jesus, in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. So there are three main things right here. Redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, and the riches of his grace. And so what is redemption? Well, the word is used in various contexts, but in this context, as Paul is utilizing it, it is the idea that, uh, of one who has been enslaved but is now set free when a payment has been made. But what makes it all the more interesting is that this tells us that we are twice Christ's. We were created by him And so he already owns us, he's our creator. But then we were purchased by him. Think of an illustration of a famous painter painting a masterpiece that he finishes. And in the night, someone breaks into his studio and steals the painting and then goes to sell it for a million dollars at the art market. But for the artist, it was his most remarkable work. He never intended on selling it in the first place. He wants it back desperately knowing that it's going off to the art auction. And so he goes to the auction and he pays the highest price to receive it back. Nobody would pay a higher price than him because it was his creation and he cherished it and he wanted it all to himself so he would purchase it no matter the cost. And so, like this, we are twice Christ. He created us, and then he purchased us, and he purchased us at a cost that none of us could ever even imagine, an unimaginable price. And for the payment that was paid, he received us in return. That is redemption. We were redeemed. It's the payment of a price or a ransom And the price to be paid was in blood, and the object that was received was our souls. Now in this, in the the previous verses, Paul paints this picture of orphans being adopted into a forever family. But here, the picture is that of a vast number of people in, they're all in a slave market, and then one man dies to set all of them free. I hope you see that all of humanity is born into the slave market of sin. And so on our own, we are completely powerless to affect any deliverance on our own. There is no escape. 
You were owned by your sin. You were enslaved by your sin. You were mastered by your sin. You could do nothing other than live in submission to your sin. And so what must be done? What is the price to be paid for sin? You all know it, for the wages of sin is death. Well, who will die to pay your ransom? The only acceptable payment was a spotless, blameless, law-keeping human sacrifice. The only acceptable payment is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he purchased his church at an infinite price. The writer of Hebrews explains, Jesus entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. Likewise, Mark 10, 45 says, Jesus came to give his life as a ransom for many. And do you know, this is such a profound marvelous, groundbreaking, earth-shaking truth that Jesus will be praised for it and the saints of God will be in awe of it for all eternity. Revelation 5, 9 through 12 is the song that will be sung before the throne of Jesus by all of the saints dressed in white and all of the creatures of heaven. John writes that everyone will be singing this new song. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for for God from every tongue and tribe and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom, a priest to our God and they shall reign on the earth. And then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Brothers and sisters, we will sing that song for all eternity with thankfulness and awe and admiration and joy that will fill our hearts forever because of our redemption in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is only but a tiny fraction now that we experience what will fill our glorified hearts when we behold Christ in all of his glory as he sits upon the throne. Now, in conjunction with redemption, we have to think about forgiveness. Redemption is only complete with pardon. It's meaningless to be set free, but to still be held liable. It is useless if the judge comes and he says, your penalty was paid by somebody else, but you will still have to pay the consequences as well. It's unjust, it would be double jeopardy. And so forgiveness goes hand in hand with redemption. If we are redeemed, we are forgiven. And without the substitutionary death of Christ, there would be no forgiveness, ever. And maybe you're more like Seneca or Albert Speer than you are like David Berkowitz. Maybe you think that your sins are too great to be forgiven. Do you think your past is too dark to be wiped away? Do you think your life is too defiled to be restored? If you do, then you don't understand the power of what God has done in Christ. You don't understand the power of the gospel to set us completely and totally and absolutely 100% free. John Calvin said, God puts our sins out of his remembrance and drowns them in the depth of the sea and moreover receives the payment that was offered him in the person of his only son. If you are in Christ, you have forgiveness now and forevermore. That's it, penalty paid. If you are in Christ, you will stand before the judge on judgment day and your record will be uh, completely covered, completely stained in the blood of Christ and not a single blot of sin will be visible and he will declare before all the universe, you are not guilty. And I hope you feel the weight of this pure, 
undefiled, refined gold of the gospel. You know, the apostle Paul, when he became a Christian, we, we just read about that. He had this profound knowledge of his forgiveness in Christ. In this life, you continue to live in the flesh and therefore you continue to sin. And it's why the, the Apostle Paul looked at his life and all that he had done and where he had gone and the, the struggle that he continued to have in his heart. And he said, I'm the chief of sinners. There's no one that's a greater sinner than I, but I am still in Christ. Martin Luther popularized the phrase simul justus et peccator, which means at the same time a sinner and justified. You will sin. You will fail sometimes, even miserably sometimes, but in Christ you are completely forgiven because you have been redeemed by his blood and for his glory. Amen. Doesn't that make us thankful? And friend, if you are not in Christ, I, I hope you hear what I'm saying. You may think in your life that your sins are pretty awful. And you know what? You're right. You're right, they are. Because they are an affront against the God who created you, the God who sustains you, the God who gives you life and breath and all of your being. You spit in his face and you trample his name every time you sin. But the absolute beauty of what God has done in Jesus Christ is that when you are in him, when your faith and when your trust is in the Lord Jesus Christ alone, when you are depending on his righteousness alone, all of your sin of the past, all of your sin in the present, all of the sin that you will commit in the future is paid for on the cross. You see, God is not a tyrant. God is not looking for a way to judge and to condemn and hurt you. No, God is full of mercy. God is full of kindness. God is full of grace. And God is full of love. Look to Christ and live. He is the way and the truth and the life and there is no other way to the Father but through him. But friend, I must ask, knowing what Christ has done to secure salvation. Why would you want to get to the Father any other way? And so will you trust the Lord Jesus with all your life? Will you die to yourself and believe the gospel? The Lord will not turn you away. And of course, all of us have to ask the question, why? And, and how is any of this even possible? Well, Paul tells us right there in the same verse, one word, Grace, grace, and notice how Paul says it. It was according to the riches of his grace. Do you know what grace is? We've talked about this very recently. If someone asks me in one word, what is the gospel? In one word, that's the only response that you can rightly give, grace. What sets Christianity apart from every worldview or religion or idea in this world? And it's grace. It is God's unmerited, undeserved favor, despite me being who I am and doing what I have done in providing salvation through Christ's sacrificial death. So you see, Paul is telling us that it took the wealth of God's grace to redeem and to forgive mankind. The wages of sin is death. We saw that, yes. But he doesn't end there. He says, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The cost of sin was the supreme sacrifice of God's son, Jesus Christ. Sin violates God's holiness and righteousness and the violator must be punished. And so God sacrificed his son, the Lord Jesus, who provided the payment for sins committed and set sinners free from their punishment. And the effect is the cancellation of sin's obligation. And so now, now we have this this permanent release from the guilt of sin and the punishment in sin, but also the enslavement of sin. And brothers and sisters, when we are in Christ, we are no longer obligated to sin like we once were. 
We no longer have to sin. When we were enslaved to sin, we had no choice. It was our master, but now Christ is our master. And we can walk in obedience to Christ. We can live godly lives. We can live holy lives. We can live lives pleasing to him as we are conformed, as we are made more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ as he is sanctifying us and all by the riches of God's grace. No, you will never reach perfection in this life, but you will mature, you will grow, you will become more like Christ, and as you do, you should see less and less sin in your life and more and more conformity to the Lord Jesus Christ. And all of this was accomplished according to the standard of God's wealth and God's grace. So in what way is God's grace given to the believer? We see in verses eight and nine that Christians are given wisdom and insight into the mystery of God's will. Notice, Paul is emphasizing how God's grace in its riches, in its wealth, is being lavished upon us or abounding toward us depending on your translation. And he says it is done very specifically. He says it is done in all wisdom and insight. Now, I must admit, this is a complicated set of verses to keep straight. There's a lot of hymns and hises and he's and us's to understand everything that he's referring to. But I think it's right to see here, to see Paul saying that God lavished upon us all wisdom and insight. And what he means by that is that wisdom and insight are being applied to us as God's people in Christ. And it's not that God is doing these things himself in all wisdom and insight. It it just really wouldn't make sense that Paul would speak that way about God because God himself is wisdom and he is omnipotent and he has all insight. And so, To say that would be redundant in terms of God's character. And so Paul is saying that wisdom and insight have come to us as the result of God's grace being lavished upon us. Hopefully that makes sense to you. And so beginning in verse eight, in Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of God's grace, which he lavishes upon us, and as a result, we are given all wisdom and insight. So the grammar hopefully sorted out, but more importantly, what does that even mean? The riches of God's grace that have been lavished on us They don't stop at election or predestination or adoption or redemption or forgiveness. No, it keeps going. There's more. God's grace so abounds that we also receive wisdom and insight. And it is so absolutely necessary if we are to have a knowledge of God's will and his eternal purposes in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so with this wisdom and with this insight, Paul writes, the mystery of God's will will be made known to us. So let me try to put all the pieces together. God has purposed in himself before the foundations of the world this great plan of redemption, this marvelous plan of salvation. It originated entirely in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we talk about that in terms of a covenant of redemption. And he purposed it himself, but you see it's not just that he planned it, but it's also that he has revealed it. It is a mystery that he has made known. And yet still more astounding, God has also done something that makes it possible for us to know and to apprehend and to receive this. This is how the riches of God's grace have been lavished upon us. It was done in all wisdom and all insight so that we might understand the mystery of God's will and his gracious purpose, which is the redemption of mankind. And I hope you see why it's essential to understand this. Many will come and look at the Christian faith and reject it all and say, either I can't understand it or 
it's unreasonable, it doesn't fit into my scientific categories, or it doesn't stand up to whatever standard they have devised to reason through the faith. But the problem, the problem is their starting point. Where does Paul start? Where does all of scripture start? In the beginning, God. With God. Wisdom and insight, you see. It doesn't come from a college degree or a textbook. It comes from God. How does a man come to a knowledge of this great salvation which is in Christ and to an understanding of the mighty and eternal purposes of God? It is God himself who must reveal it in all wisdom and insight. And unless and until he does, the things of God are foolishness to the man who is not in Christ. And this is, this is why Paul says what is revealed to us is at once a mystery. The meaning is not that it is, it is something that's incomprehensible, but that it is unknown and unknowable and undiscoverable by the human mind alone. On our own, we would never be able to understand what God has done in the history of redemption. However, once it is revealed to us in wisdom and insight, we are made able by God, by the power of his spirit, through his word, we are made able to understand it. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 2 that God's wisdom is hidden. He notes that the, the princes of this world did not know God's wisdom because they were, they were seeking to understand it with their unaided minds. But God has revealed wisdom to us by his spirit and the spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. And so we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit that is God that we may know things that are freely given to us of God. We may know these things, but they are made known to us by the operation of the Holy Spirit. And so to the Christian, the mysteries of redemption are an open secret because God in his grace and kindness has been pleased to, to unfold this mystery and to reveal it to all of us. So if you claim to be a Christian and yet you also say you cannot understand the truth, that you cannot understand and grasp the things of God and, and you can't really understand or grasp the gospel, either one of two things is going on. Either you're not a Christian or you're a lazy Christian. Every Christian has been given wisdom and insight so that we can understand the word of God. Every Christian has the Holy Spirit dwelling within them who illumines the scriptures that helps us to understand. This doesn't mean it's easy. This doesn't mean you're gonna understand everything in like manner. Even, even Peter admits that about Paul's writings. Some of the things that Paul writes are difficult. Right, Peter tells us it's not all straightforward, it's not all easy, but it's all there and it's there for a reason. It's there for us to read and to study and to understand and God gives us all that we need to have all wisdom and insight. You don't, you don't have to have a PhD. You don't have to have a Bible degree. You don't have to be older in order to understand the things of God. If you are in Christ, he gives you what you need that you might understand more and more of him and who he is and what he is doing and all the implications of the fact that you are in Christ. Don't be a lazy Christian. Study the word. And again, it's not going to be easy. It, we have to work for it. It takes time. And so we can't say this is too difficult it's difficult, but it's never too difficult. That's a lazy excuse. We need to study and dig and keep learning, and I believe we will be learning more about God for all eternity. But we're made able to do so, so we don't, we don't just sit back and shrug our shoulders and say, it's too vast, it's too much. We'll never know it all, so I'm not even gonna try. You know, uh, Jonathan Edwards was considered the greatest intellect in all American history. 
faithful preacher of God's word, went to be the president of Yale, but died as soon as he got there. But he described studying the word of God, saying, it's like each time I set out to learn something more of God, it's like climbing up a mountain, and I climbing the mountain, and it's hard work, it's difficult labor, and then I get to the top of the mountain and think I've accomplished something great, and I look out and I see there's a vast, vast valley of mountains yet to be climbed. And this is where we are, brothers and sisters, and where we will always be. But the Lord has given you a gift to know more of him in a way that natural man never will. Philosophers have been trying to understand something about God since the beginning of, co- of time, but God has revealed himself directly to you in Christ. Don't waste that gift. And you know, this should inform our missions and our evangelism because it means that we can go to tribal people who can't read or write or have no formal education, and yet preach the same gospel to them with that same confidence that we preach it in any other context because God can remove the scales from their eyes by the power of the Holy Spirit, just like he does for all of his people anywhere else. And so remember, the the first Christians, remember them, they were simple people. Fishermen, slaves, military men, They weren't the learned schoolmen and philosophers of the day. Very unlikely most of them knew how to read and write. But it's it's no surprise that those who did not even give recognition to the God they know exists, much less trust or serve him, do not have the slightest idea of what life or the universe or eternity is all about. There's a French philosopher named Andre Morwa, and he said, the universe is indifferent. Who created it? Why are we on this puny mud heap spinning in infinite space? I have not the slightest idea, and I'm convinced that no one has the least idea. Now, surely you've heard such things. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty five, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to whom? To the little children. You see, when God takes away sin in redemption, he doesn't leave us in spiritual, moral, and and a, a mental vacuum where we just have to work things out on our own. No, he lavishes, he lavishes wisdom and insight on us according to the riches of his grace just as he lavishes forgiveness on us according to those riches as well. So why has God done so much for us? Why has he blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places? Why has he chosen us in Christ before the foundations of the world? Why has he made us holy and blameless and predestined us to adoption as his children and redeemed us through his blood and lavished grace upon grace upon grace and forgiveness and wisdom and insight according to the infinite riches of his wisdom? Why? Why? Well, Paul tells us, verses nine and 10, that Christians are part of God's plan for the fullness of time. You see, history is going somewhere. Everything, everything will one day make sense when it's understood by all to be under the full, complete, and unhindered headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. What do the all things in heaven and on earth encompass that he writes about here? Regenerated souls, the created universe, The work has begun with God's children. Believers are united together in the body of Christ over which he is the head. And so this this brings believing Jews and Gentiles together as one people. That was a major miracle in Paul's eyes. A, A solidarity between the church triumphant in heaven and the church militant on the earth. It is a reality here and now. 
However, whether we are here on the earth or we are in heaven with God, we all share in what God has given us and we will all be brought together in him. Calvin said, man has been lost, but angels were not out of danger. By uniting together both into his own body, Christ has conjoined them to God the Father that he might establish a true harmony in heaven and on earth. This is the new order of things. The cosmos, which Christ created and sustains, will be ordered under Christ. Paul says in Colossians 1, 16, that all things were created by him and for him, or toward him. He is the alpha and the omega the beginning and the end. And so all things came out of him and all things will return to him. And so all creation is moving toward the consummation in him as described in Romans 8. The creation waits with eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. The creation itself will be liberated from its bondage of decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. And so all redeemed souls, all of the universe, all of the angelic hosts, literally everything in heaven and on earth, everything material, everything spiritual, everything within, without, above, and below will be united in the Lord Jesus Christ. The unknown multitude of galaxies and the endless reaches of space. Everything on earth from the highest peak to the lowest ditch. Everything to the core of the planet. Every plant, every tree, every animal, every insect, every single-celled organism, every atom of existence, every force of nature, hurricanes and tornadoes and monsoons and earthquakes and avalanches and floods and blizzards and thunderstorms and hail and sleet, every cell of bacteria that causes cancer and COVID and the flu and AIDS, every country, every government, every army, every president, every prime minister and king and prince and governor and senator and mayor, Boko Haram and ISIS and Hamas and the Taliban and Al Qaeda, every news story, every sporting event, every form of entertainment and all of the knowledge of all of the education in all of the world universities and academic journals and laboratories and research facilities, every business, every bank, every manufacturing plant, every form of transportation, everything you can find on the internet along with everything you don't want to find on the internet and every last single hair of your head every last cell of skin on your body, every last fleeting thought of your mind, all of it will come to its full and complete final consummation and all of God's purposes and his reasons for every bit of it will be fulfilled and will be revealed and he will receive all the glory and all of his people will sing with one heart and one voice with all of the angelic hosts loudly and forevermore to the praise of his glorious grace. This is where Paul was headed. This is what he is writing about in Ephesians 1. And this is why he begins in verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Everything. Everything. This is why Paul writes at the end of Romans 11. Oh, the depths of his riches and wisdom and knowledge. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Who's given a gift to him as though he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. So glory be to him forever and ever. If we can't sing that with our hearts, we don't understand how great and glorious and majestic and holy our God truly is. He's bigger and greater than anything we could ever put in our minds to imagine. 
And so Paul looks at all that God has done. He looks at all that God is doing and he looks at what God is moving us toward in the future when everything is finally and completely brought under the total headship of Christ and he is praising God. He is praising the Lord Jesus Christ. And for all of us, for all of us, the best part is this. All of these blessings, they they don't belong to the angels. They don't belong to the most educated of the world. They don't belong to just a few select people who were able to keep it all together until the finish line. No, they belong to all of us who are in Jesus Christ. To the Apostle Paul, to David Berkowitz, and to you and me. We are the redeemed of God, brothers and sisters. And so let us set our eyes and our hearts and our minds on Christ. Everything is coming together in him and he is pouring every promise, every spiritual blessing and much more upon us because he gives and he gives and he gives in lavish abundance. And friend, if you don't know this God, look to him, look to him. Because one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Today is the day that you can do that willingly because one day, if you do not, you will do it unwillingly. Turn to Christ today, for today is the day of salvation, all to the praise of his glorious grace. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your abundant, lavished grace. We thank you, O God, that you are not weak, that you are not small, but in fact that you are far greater and far more majestic than our minds will ever comprehend. We thank you that you have revealed so much of yourself to us. We thank you for salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for your word, that as we turn to your word, we learn more and more of you. And in so doing, we become more and more like Christ as we grow up in him, as the Holy Spirit continues to guide us and to lead us. We pray, O God, that we would be faithful to heed your word and to live as faithful disciples that we would not take for granted that you have lavished all wisdom and insight upon us, but that we would dedicate our lives to understanding the mysteries of the gospel. And Lord, I pray for any who are here today who do not know Christ, that you might arrest their hearts, that you might free them from the slave market of sin, and that you might give them new life in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, oh God, would you do that? Would you do that, Lord, that you would be glorified and that we, along with the church triumphant in heaven, would all rejoice together. We pray, O God, you would do all of these things for your glory alone. In Jesus' name, amen.